Hello and welcome to SME TV. I'm your host, Angela Vithoulkis, bringing you the latest in news and views for the SME community. At the end of 2019, there were over 2 million small businesses of various sizes in Australia. We talk about that a lot, but what we don't talk about, but should, is the 5 million people that are employed and earn an income from those businesses. To join our SME TV community, just subscribe to our YouTube channel and we encourage you to comment and share our episodes. That's where we need your support. SME TV levels the playing field when it comes to giving you and your business a voice. I promise you'll get heard. Joining us today to discuss the crisis facing many of our SMEs now, but in particular our Victorian SMEs, is Bill Lang, Executive Director of Small Business Australia. Welcome, Bill. Hello, Angela. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's greatly appreciated. And I know that um, Victorian businesses in general are having a really tough time right now. So for those of us around Australia who aren't experiencing the same, um, we send our, our deepest hope that it, the uh, lockdowns change immediately, but that's still a long way off into the distant future. What's the, um, what's the Premier saying at the, at the moment? What's the latest down there? Yeah, look, there's been uh, you know, a couple of sort of glimmers of hope in recent days. So outside of Melbourne, uh, the rest of Victoria is now getting back to work. So that's great news uh, in terms of the various numbers and things that they're looking at around how they might go about restrict, uh, loosening up the restrictions in Victoria. Uh, you know, the numbers seem to be going in the right direction. So there's also some more positive news there. There's still lots of inconsistencies, lots of complexity, you know, pretty much lots of unfairness with respect to what many small businesses, particularly here uh, in the Melbourne area, are facing. So, Bill, the ACA research indicates that 72% of businesses are now concerned about their survival. That's about 1.5 million of them. Surely those numbers should be making the state and federal governments sit up and take notice. Yeah, look, I, I certainly know that at Small Business Australia, you know, we believe in things being simpler for everyone in small business, fairer, and therefore they'll be better. And with better small businesses, we'll have a better Australia. And, uh, you know, a number of the conversations that we're having, uh, particularly with the federal government and with cabinet ministers, uh, they are paying attention. They are seeing uh, this particular information. Uh, they're hearing about the key things that various organisations like the SME Association, Small Business Australia are actually asking for. Uh, and, you know, we, we are optimistic that we'll see some more practical uh, changes taking place in coming weeks. Well, Bill, you and I have both experienced government responses at different levels and, and from different states, and they're of often very slow to not only step up, but to understand the true implications of some of their decisions. It's become obvious, though, uh, ironically, lately, that the word or the phrase of, of small business has been used repeatedly uh, a lot more frequently, perhaps outside of election time. Um, they are obviously saying all the time, oh, small business this, small business that. But do they understand, though, the implications of what we are worth to the economy in general? Not just labour, but the fact that we, we are the ones that are agile, we are the ones that pivot. And it's not the first instinct of any small business to retrench or fire staff to even out the bottom line, whereas we're noticing that a lot of big businesses in Australia have gone straight for the jugular in terms of retrenching or restructuring. Look, I think it's fair to say, Angela, that, uh, you know, politicians are professionals and they pay attention to the things that matter most to them, and that's getting votes. Uh, and so in reality, you know, if small business people and the five million people that rely upon, you know, their financial security from working in small businesses, if they really want to be heard, they've got to think about who they're voting for, looking very closely at what is getting promised in terms of policies. You know, here in Victoria, we've got our local government elections about to come up. There's 2,000 people uh, running to be on councils. I think there's about 600 positions, but 2,000 are running. Uh, yeah, we've got potentially a federal election uh, sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, of course, we've got a Queensland state election coming up. And I know the small business owners around the Gold Coast and in far north Queensland that rely upon the tourism industry have a very different view from a bunch of voters that are living in Brisbane. But uh, yes, to truly um... be heard, to truly be heard, we need to be organised. And we yes. need to actually vote actively and we need to let the politicians know at all levels that we're paying attention uh, and that we want more, we want simpler things that are easy to understand, easier to implement, uh, therefore they'll be fairer and better for everybody. Absolutely. Streamlining is uh, the middle name of a small business and it should be the middle name of any government to save money and they forget that the only reason they get any money is from the taxpayer and yet they, they squander our hard-earned dollars on... Uh, on, I don't know if you saw um, some of the headlines this morning, but um, 
I, I wouldn't want to be the one approving some of those grants. Uh, the ABS survey indicates that 10%, which is almost 220,000, will close when government support is withdrawn. Are you hearing from your members that that kind of fear of when JobKeeper or JobSeeker is reduced yeah, on look, the likelihood it, it, that they no, won't be no able to... There's no question that there are a number of you know, small business totally reliant upon effectively those JobKeeper payments coming in, uh, particularly given that they've uh, been getting some relief in terms of when they need to pay their rent uh, and when they need to start repaying their loan. So let's not forget that, you know, in addition to employment costs, there are lots of overheads involved uh, in running any type of business. So uh, we think it's going to be more than 10%. You know, the, the reality is is probably 10% have already closed permanently. They've, they've already gone over the last six months. You know, at the end of the day, uh, businesses large and small, you know, require customers. Customers are the oxygen of businesses. And if you're restricted from having uh, customers by various regulations, or secondly, the customers are that scared in terms of their health, what the future looks like, and they keep their hands in their pocket, you end up with a double whammy. In some cases, you're not allowed to have any customers. And then to the extent that you can, they're frightened to go about you know, what they would typically do and what they would typically buy. So we have a crisis of confidence, particularly here in Victoria. And to give you an indication of that, like across Australia, since the start of the year, there's been about a 3% reduction in what households spend. In Victoria, it's been 30% reduction. It's, it's very clear, Bill, that, and, and that was where my next question was going to go. There's two paths being travelled here. There's the national path of how people are affected overall when they look at the data and they even everything out. But the experience in Victoria has been particularly harsh. Uh, and as you've just pointed out, the, the, the difference in figures on impact is astounding. Uh, absolutely. And, and look, you know, some people say, look, you know, two speed economy, two different things. You know, we know in small business that, look, every small business is different. You know, the actual uh, sector that they're in is different. And even within states, you know, the geography that they're, are, they're in are different. So there's a bunch of accommodation businesses, service businesses in the Gold Coast and far north Queensland, really struggling due to border closures and people not being able to get there for holidays. But if you go to uh, the Kimberley area up in Western Australia, there's plenty of people from Western Australia holidaying in Western Australia and going up there when they've never been there in the past because they're not going to Bali or going to places like that. So that will they, in fact, they, we have multiple, multiple economies, state. multiple speeds and multiple impacts. But certainly here in Melbourne, this is ground zero. There's 5 million people locked down. They can't go more than five kilometres from their homes. They have to stay at home in most cases. Um, you know, the, the, the general impact down here on small businesses across the board uh, is catastrophic. Do you think they had to do this? Do you think that these measures were exactly what was needed or that they were... Look, I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, in the future, we're going to see more plain English and more plain sight. So rather than the buzzwords like transparency and all of those things, most Australians don't trust politicians, unfortunately, and they don't trust what That's they true. hear in the media. But when we, when we shine some plain light on the decisions that have been made, how they were made, who made them, and the actual reasons they were made for... Now, my personal belief is that we're going to see that we've that the cure for the so-called uh, disease is going to have a far greater cost on the health, livelihoods, and, and overall future prospects, uh, particularly of Melbournians, compared to other options that were open. But we have a government that says there's only one option. They've got no option. They've got no option, which we can't believe. We've always got choices. Now, they have made a particular choice to go down a particular path, and uh, it would appear that there's no turning back. And if I might say that they made these choices in Victoria because of some stuff ups that happened to start with, not because it's it's affecting the rest of Australia any differently, but it's clear that when rules aren't followed and there's a two speed economy, but there's also apparently two sets of rules when the contact tracing, when the quarantining, et cetera, was stuffed up and then it spread like wildfire because they didn't know what was going on. Bill, it, it happened the same everywhere else and it happened the same in New South Wales. It's just that the ability to contain it has been the biggest difference. Not that COVID has behaved differently in Victoria, but just the way that we've reacted to it, I think, in the other states. I want to jump ahead to um, some of the measures, the, re the recovery measures that you as part of um, the small business organisation you're talking about the insolvency and recover as part of the recovery. So to amend the bankruptcy laws, the insolvency laws, why do you feel that these will make a difference to small business? Well, well, there's a couple of things. So why should any small business owner be made legally bankrupt 
because they can't pay their debts as a result of the government policies to deal with COVID. That through and no that's fault just a, of their own... Let's, let's just be clear here, Bill. We're talking about debts that, have, that accumulate and start because of COVID, not because they had debts before. Well, well, well again, I, I think we can take more of an open mind. They may well have had debts before, but their ability to service those debts because they've been starved of customers or the customers have lost confidence, their ability to then service those debts going forward has been impacted. You know, if, you, if you're going to be insolvent or have to close your business, why be made legally bankrupt if the, if the cause of this is the result of the response to COVID? And what we're talking about here is the legal dimensions of bankrupt. Why even use that word? There's a whole range of stigmas associated with it. There's a whole bunch of legal ramifications. And Angela, I'd say to all of your viewers, who's going to be creating the jobs going forward? Who's going to take the risks? It's small business people. Like small business people don't get born, they are made. And we can't have these people being legally restrained from going back into business as a result of being made legally bankrupt, let alone dealing with the inordinate amount of stress and distress, given the unknown implications for many of them of what bankruptcy means. We want that whole terminology taken off the table. Let's call it a COVID business closure. Let's work out what debts can be repaid to what level. Uh, let's have all the debtors, all the creditors, I should say, take a bit of a haircut, as we used to say in the banking game, as opposed to, no, they don't take any haircut. What they end up with is the small business owner being decapitated. That's it. No, that's exactly right. You end up paying for something for the rest of your life and you can't always preface every conversation when you get a bad credit rating with, oh, it was because of COVID. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't need to have to defend something that was entirely out of your hands and has nothing to do with your capabilities as a business owner and operator, but everything to do with really bad timing. What about, Bill, some of the concerns that we might have around the zombie businesses and people deliberately taking advantage of relaxing the insolvency laws, the phoenixing, et cetera? What about the small business owners that will inevitably get taken up in that flow because someone's going to tweak the system or rot it. Yeah, look, I think it's a sad fact of life uh, and, you know, proven over, you know, many, many years of evolution that there's always a proportion of people that are immoral, that operate illegally, that are quite happy to take advantage of other people, take advantage of loopholes, play the system to their own personal benefit. Uh, and I think for any of us that have ever experienced them, we know they end up dying uh, very lonely uh, and very unhappy people. But that's a very small percentage, Angela. We shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater with respect to saying, oh, well, we wouldn't want to be protecting people on X, Y, and Z if they do A, B, and C. You know, if anything, the governments need to get a bit smarter by making things a bit simpler uh, in terms of how some of these various programs they come up with actually work. So there aren't as many loopholes that these uh, devious, immoral, illegal operators go and find of which there are, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, there's not as many of them in the small business category. It's usually the middle large tier that um, can, can employ the experts to design these amazing systems that they can rot anything that, that happens to be uh, available to them. But we've got to wrap it up. But any last uh, suggestions to the federal or state government about what they should be doing so we can get out of this crisis faster? Look, we, we have a petition uh, called Save Our Small Businesses and the website for that is uh, www.sosbiz.com.au. We've got a 10-point plan there, Angela. It's very straightforward. There are things for each level of government to do that will be simpler and fairer and much more effective. But more generally to, to your viewers, uh, keep going. You know, Get some help if you need some help. Various governments are providing various access to mentoring and advisory services. Uh, you know, you'll be able to get through it. You may have to start again. Uh, if things are not looking good from an insolvency point of view, start talking to some professionals and getting some advice on it, getting going on that sort of stuff much earlier rather than sort of hoping that it's going to go away. Hope is not a strategy. You need to take some action. You need to get some help. Exactly, exactly right, Bill. On that note, um, hope is not a strategy. Reality often is uh, a a bucket of cold water, but a necessary conversation. And for anyone out there that might be suffering any mental health issues, please talk to someone, reach out. There is a lot of help around you. This is, there is light at the end of this tunnel, Bill. I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Uh, to everybody out there in our viewer land, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, we ask you to do that. At the same time, don't forget to check out the uh, SOS website that Bill mentioned, and we'll put that in our notes as well. To the Piedmont Studio, thank you so much for making us look and sound good. To the SMEA Association, without you, we wouldn't be here, so thank you. If you have any questions, tips, comments or stories, you can email them directly to me. News at smea.org.au, and we're across all the socials. Thank you so much for joining us, Bill. We'll catch you again, I'm sure. Thank you, Angela.